global warming and climate change. These are particularly current topics and of great interest to most people. We are told that man's burning of fossil fuels is causing global warming through the production of carbon dioxide. This is the most ridiculous rubbish possible. Carbon dioxide is a natural gas essential for plant growth, which in turn is essential for our survival. Carbon dioxide levels have long since reached the level where any increase has almost no further effect on warming. The percentage produced by man of carbon dioxide is trivial, as the vast majority of carbon dioxide comes out of some 150,000 underwater volcanoes. The next largest amount is produced by animals and insects, and man's contribution is a poor per, a per third place. Global warming and global cooling are natural events which were taking place long before man was around in any significant numbers, and certainly centuries before the burning of fossil fuels started. The contribution from all the cars in all the world is only about 1.7% of man's minor contribution, and the fussing about carbon front footprint is only a con which is being used to extract more money from the ordinary person. In the year 2006, David Archibald in his document Climate Outlook to 2030 at www.davidarchibald.info published the graph shown here. This is an interesting graph. Each increase in carbon dioxide concentration has less and less impact on the overall warming effect. Most of the warming is caused by the first 20 parts per million, and you can see how staggeringly small the additional amounts are. Pre-industrial level had 280 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. The level in 2006 was 380 parts per million. That's atmospheric carbon dioxide that we're talking about here. The graph clearly shows that even a big increase in the present dio carbon dioxide level has almost no impact on atmospheric temperature. It has also been calculated that an increase to 620 parts per million would give a temperature increase of only 0.16 degrees centigrade. The graph shown above together with its calculations should have ended any further discussion about reducing carbon dioxide emissions. However, this has most definitely not been the case. For financial reasons, a decision has apparently been taken to keep up the pressure on carbon dioxide reductions resulting in senseless investments on new technology for capture and storing carbon dioxide. Beautiful windmills absolutely everywhere, the mandatory use of biofuel, which has a negative impact on food production. Don't forget about all the revenue which governments are getting from climate taxes. All these taxes and the massive spending of taxpayers' money really threatens the economic foundations of the whole of the Western world, but worse still are the consequence of the commitment to use biofuel. This mad strategy has caused a near doubling of the cost of cooking oil and essential foods such as rice, because farmland is now being used for the production of biofuel. These increases are hitting poor countries the most, as the people can no longer afford to pay for basic necessities. If the intention of the IPPC and the world's politicians is to starve people to death, then they're definitely on the right track through their continued insistence on the supposedly harmful effects of carbon dioxide. In reality, 
the greenhouse gas which has the most effect is actually water vapour, which accounts for about 98% of all warming. I wonder how the politicians are going to prevent water vapour from getting into our atmosphere. In his video, An Inconvenient Truth, Al Gore points out the close correlation between the fluctuations of global temperature and the levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. He points out strong rises and falls in the average global temperature, nearly all of which are before mankind started burning oil, and the related strong rises and falls of carbon dioxide carbon dioxide concentration in the air. What he is very careful to avoid mentioning is the fact that the changes in carbon dioxide concentration lag behind the global temperature changes. The carbon dioxide concentrations are a result of the global warming and not the cause of it. This is further emphasised by the speech given by Professor Ian Pilmer to the British Parliament. That speech is reproduced here. He says, I'm a geologist and the one thing that we miss out on in looking at climate change is the past. Climates have always changed. Climate changes in the past have been greater and faster than anything we experience in our lifetime and sea levels have always changed. Not by the model modest couple of millimetres that people are having kittens about. We have had in the past sea level changes of only 1,500 metres. Now that's a sea level change. And if we look back in the history of time, the atmosphere once had a very large amount of carbon dioxide in it. It has now got less than 0.04%. Where did that carbon dioxide go? It went into chalk limestone, shells and life. And we've been sequestering carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere for only 10,500 million years. This planet has been degassing carbon dioxide since it the planet first formed. Carbon dioxide is a natural gas. It has dominated the atmosphere for an extraordinarily long period of time and we're now at a dangerously low level. If we have the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere we would have no terrestrial plants. Carbon dioxide is plant food. It is not a pollutant. To use words like pollution with carbon dioxide is misleading and deceptive. But the past gives us a wonderful story. In the past we have had six major ice ages. We are currently in an ice age. It started 34 million years ago. And when South America had the good sense to pull away from Antarctica, and there is a circumpolar current set up which isolated Antarctica and uh, we start to get the Antarctic ice sheet. We have had periods of glaciation and interglacials. We are currently in an interglacial and during that 34 million years we have refrigerated the earth. But for less than 20% of time we have had ice on planet Earth. The rest of the time it has been warmer and wetter and there's been more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And what did life do? It thrived. Six of the six great ice ages were initiated when the carbon dioxide content of the atmosphere was higher than now. In fact, up to a thousand times higher than now. So we have from the geological evidence absolutely no evidence that carbon dioxide has driven climate. For some odd reason the major driver of climate is that great ball of heat in the sky which we call the Sun. You heard it here first. 
it is really quite unusual. Every now and again continents start to move and they move with very at very rapid rates. They move about 10 inches every year and at one time a continent can be over a pole and at another time it can be at the equator. Those moving continents change the major heat balance on the earth and that is the ocean currents. The oceans carry far more heat than the atmosphere does. Every now and then, because of major geological processes, we get gr a great bulge on the ocean floor. This bulge is of new volcanic rock. That changes ocean currents. Every year we have 10,000 cubic kilometers of seawater which goes through new, vo new volcanic rock on, on the ocean floor. That exchanges heat. The reaction between seawater and the rocks stops the ocean becoming acid. When we run out of rocks, the oceans will, will become acid. But don't wait up, it will be a long time. We see 1,500 volcanoes on Earth. We only measure 20 of them. And very few of those measurements are really accurate. But they tell us that a little carbon dioxide leaks out of those volcanoes. But what we don't hear is that there are at least 3,470,000 volcanoes on the sea floor, and they leak out huge amounts of carbon dioxide. We have pools of liquid carbon dioxide on the sea floor. So early, first carbon dioxide, where did it go? And where did it erupt? Where did it come from? It came from rocks. What did it do to the planet? We did not fry and die. We didn't have runaway greenhouse effects. Now that's just geology. That's not important. Huh. Let's look at more modern times. In more modern times we had drill cores which have gone through the ice sheets. Snow when it falls catches and traps some air. That air is trapped in the ice. We can later extract it from the drill core and measure the amount of carbon dioxide in the air. And we can see what our cycles of glaciation and interglacials, that when we finish an interglacial event, that we release carbon dioxide some 800 years later. So what's that telling us? It's telling us that temperature is driving carbon dioxide and not that carbon dioxide is driving temperature. Oh yes, but that's only hundreds of thousands of years ago. Forget that. Well, let's go to more modern times. We have been measuring temperatures accurately since 1850 and the accuracy is plus or minus one degree Celsius for those old measurements. We've been told that this 0.7 degrees Celsius rise is going to create a disaster. I've only got to move a single step away and I've had a 0.7 degrees Celsius rise. Where do people go for summer holidays? You go to a warm climate. We are cre creatures from the Rift Valley. We like warm climates. If someone from Helsinki moves to Singapore there's an average temperature rise of 22 degrees Celsius. People in Singapore don't drop dead in the streets from the temperature. So we are t creatures of warm climate. We've been measuring temperatures and we've seen a slight warming from 1860 to 1890, then a slight cooling to 1910, then a warming until 1940. So that is to say that the North West Passage was open. Then there was a cooling until 1977 and now warming until the end of the century. And now we're in a period of cooling. So we've had these cycles of warming and cooling. Strangely, these cycles are actually related to changes in heat balance in the oceans. 
So we've had these 60 year cycles over a long warming event. We are in a period of global warming. It has been warming since the minimum 330 years ago. Those were the times when you had the ice layers on the Thames. These are the times when the Dutch masters painted hoar frosts and bitterly cold conditions. That was the time when the sun was a bit inactive and we had no sunspot activity. So we are in a long period of warming uh, and one of the questions that I ask in my book Heaven and Earth Global Warming The Missing Science is which part of the last 330 years of warming is due to human activity and which part is na natural these are questions which kids should ask their school teachers and they are deliberately unanswerable questions because I am in the of the view that many children are being fed environmental propaganda in the schools and are not being given the critical and analytical facilities to be able to dissect an argument. So we are in a period of warming. What's the worry? It's quite normal. And let's just look at history. The one thing which the climate industry ignores is history. In Roman times it was warm was considerably warmer than now. We know that. They kept good records. They grew olives up the Rhine River as far as Bourne. They had wine grapes in Yorkshire. We know from their clothing that it was warm. Possibly they were going to an orgy, but I think it's more likely that it was warm. And that warming suddenly stopped in the year 535. We entered the Dark Ages. In 535 AD we had Krakatoa, which filled the atmosphere with aerosols. And it wasn't a big volcano. Only 30 cubic kilometers of aerosols go into the atmosphere. We had bigger ones in Yellowstone, and they had even bigger ones in New Zealand, where 10,000 cubic kilometers of aerosols have gone into the atmosphere. We had two volcanoes, one in Rahal and one in Krakatoa in Indonesia in 535 to 536 AD, leading to the Dark Ages. It was cool. What happened? Crops failed. We starved. We had civil unrest. We had cannibalism. We broke out of that into the medieval warming. The first to feel it were the Vikings as the seas became calmer, they could get further on their fishing trips. They actually got to Newfoundland, which they called Vinland. In Greenland, grapes and barley were growing. The grape roots were deep as there was no permafrost. It was a wonderful, benign climate. Five degrees warmer than now. Eric the Red was saying, come to Greenland, it's a wonderful climate. And it was. And then we went through 23 years of low solar activity. And in 23 years, we went from the medieval warming into the Little Ice Age. And that, as I said, ended 330 years ago. What do you think would happen after a Little Ice Age? Do you think it would get colder or it would get warmer? The only reason that the arguments of science have got any traction in society is that they have been related to the last 30 or 40 years of temperature measurements. I see with great interest that the Met Office is telling us that this is the hottest year on record. They might be on a different calendar to me but I didn't think that this year was finished yet. And this time last year I was in London as I was the year before and it was miserable it was cold, it was very cold. So one has to be very sceptical of these sorts of predictions made just before a big climate conference. In science, scepticism is not a derogatory word. In science there is no consensus. In science there are constant battles. A good example, we all knew that we got ulcers from acid stomach and stress 
and we took pills and rubbed our bellies and hoped the ulcers would go away. But two scientists who were not following the mainstream, and who are not following the consensus, were arguing that this was due to a bacteria, and no one listened. Ultimately, one of them took the bacteria, developed ulcers, took the antidote, and for that they got a Nobel Prize. You do not get a Nobel Prize for following a consensus, or saying that the science is settled. I believe that we have had enormous corruption of science and the scientific method. I believe that the monies which are floating around for climate research, which is a current, which is a current fad and fashion, are quite perverse. I believe that we're putting science backwards, and that the next inevitable pandemic, we may not have the weapons to handle it. We might go waving herbs and chanting rather than creating an antidote. So this for me, this climate industry, has made a huge attack on the scientific method. It has been an attack on my science and history. And things are fortunately changing. I finish with one last point. You've got your Climate Change Act and we've just got a carbon tax in Australia. Nineteen pills, bills went through Parliament and our carbon tax is to lower carbon dioxide emissions from our employment generating industries in Australia. And it's wonderful. We've led the world in suicide. And our carbon tax is to knock down our emissions by 5%. Now you can do the sums and the sums are very simple. The IPCC says that 3% of annual emissions are from humans. Why is it that 3% drives climate change and not the other 97% is beyond me. That's another matter. Australia put out 1.5% of the world's CO2 emissions. You can do the calculations and by Australia knocking back their emissions by 5%, we will, by the year 2050, have lowered, lowered global temperatures by 0.0007 degrees Celsius. So I do hope that you enjoy our sacrifice in giving you a warmer climate in England. Recently, the P P PBS America showed a two-episode presentation entitled Decoding the Weather Machine. It contains some excellent photography and interesting ports, reports on developments in the renewable energy field. Unfortunately, the presenter seems so determined to reach the conclusion that there is a rise in world temperatures caused by the burning of fossil fuels, an issue which allows the gathering of massive amounts of money, that they revert to silly conclusions of the style, all healthy dogs have four legs, my healthy cat has four legs, so my cat is a dog. The PBS America presentation correctly states that carbon dioxide and water vapour are both greenhouse gases, but they do not state that carbon dioxide is a natural, vital and important gas, essential for plant growth and so is vital for humans growing food, and more importantly, increases in the present concentration of carbon dioxide will have almost no effect on world temperatures, water vapour being the main greenhouse gas. The PBS America presentation also states that changes in Earth's temperature are caused by changes in Earth's orbit around the Sun. Personally, I don't believe that Earth orbits the Sun. Astronomers state categorically that certain astronomical observations could not possibly be made if Earth were actually orbiting the Sun. But I don't want to get into that here. They also state that Earth spinning on its axis is a major cause of weather patterns and changes in temperature. Really? Who says that the Earth is spinning? I'm sorry, I just don't buy that. It has become obvious recently that the people who control television and other media are increasingly desperate to convince people that the Earth is a spinning globe. 
Personally, I don't really care what shape the earth is. It works just fine for me the way that it is. However, I do object to being lied to. A little arithmetic can help us test if the earth is spinning or not. We are told that the earth is a globe, or supposedly an oblate spheroid, which is near enough the same thing, and that has a circumference of about 25,000 miles and spins once on its axis in 24 hours, give or take four minutes. Let's assume that we live far enough away from the equator so that at our latitude the circumference of the Earth is only 12,500 miles. If that were the case, then the ground under our feet would move 12,500 miles in 24 hours. That is, 520 miles each hour, or 8.68 miles per minute, or 768 feet per second, which is 232 meters per second. If you or a friend of yours own a rifle, then we can determine if the earth is spinning or not. To do that, find a safe deserted place and set up the rifle in a secure stand and a target directly north of the stand. Far one shot. If the bullet hits the target, then the earth is not spinning, as the target will have moved a substantial distance sideways while the bullet is in the air. That fact is agreed by science following Newton's work, which states that a moving object, such as a bullet, would continue to move in a straight line unless it's acted on by some external force. But perhaps the air near the Earth's surface rotates at about the same speed as the Earth's surface, and perhaps it pushes the bullet sideways. So reverse the gun and the target and fire a second shot, this time aiming due south. If the shot hits the target instead of missing it by meters, then the Earth is not spinning. Moving air does deflect a bullet, but not by much, and certainly not by meters. In one tenth of a second, the ground would theoretically have moved more than 23 metres, and air could not possibly account for deflecting a bullet by that much. Long-range snipers do not make any allowance for the earth turning, no matter what distance they fire over. However, does climate change happen? Yes, it does, and it always has, and it's caused by changes in the sun, not by humans burning oil and coal. One major benefit of the carbon tax scam is that it gives an incentive for polluters to clean up their emissions. I just hope that Earth's population is not harmed by the silly schemes to draw carbon dioxide out of the air and put it where plants can't benefit from it.